Welcome to the Krusty Fox, and today we're racing to the finish line with Season 1, Episode 9 of Sex in the City, titled The Turtle and the Hare. Carrie begins this episode by telling us the tale of Brooke, who she claims is the most perfect person in a city of perfect people. And you know by now that when she's being needlessly complimentary about another woman, there's bound to be a sting in the tail. Brooke, an interior designer by trade, apparently only dates A-listers and has a new arm to hang off every weekend. We're shown the bland, besuited men in question, and frankly, the A in A-lister appears to stand for something uncomplimentary. Brooke finally decides to marry, and despite blowing a cool and wildly unnecessary hundred grand on the big day, courts disaster by inviting Carrie, Miranda, Charlotte and Samantha, as well as their shared plus one, dysfunction. Naturally, Carrie implies that Brooke's motivation in doing so was to show off, which is the only reason I can think of that all four of them decided to show up dressed for a funeral. At the apparently less prestigious of two singles tables, because of course she'd be offended by how much attention that would rob her of, they're joined by fellow guest Bernie Turtletaub. The Turtle, as he's known, is seemingly notable for his healthy investments and honking breath. He shows an immediate interest in Samantha and a surprising resilience in the face of how poorly all four of the ladies treat him. He engages Carrie in stinky, dull conversation while Charlotte avoids eye contact, Samantha dashes off to find better prey, and Miranda resists the urge to unhinge her jaw and chase the male guests around the dance floor like Ms. Pac-Man. On the way out, Brooke imparts each of them with little pearls of, admittedly smug, newly married wisdom. Carrie's is the best. It's always better to marry someone who loves you more than you love them. If you have Carrie Dashes Back Home to write a column about it on your bingo card, congratulations, you're a winner. People are always telling me things I don't want to hear, she says. We know this already, of course. They're things like stop writing about me, don't turn up at my house at 4am, and literally anybody else could do your job better. Carrie, who up until this point has shown nothing but disdain for any of the married couples she's encountered, calls Big to ask him about Brooke's comment and is horrified to hear him say that he has no intention of ever remarrying. Carrie wonders if she can date a man who wouldn't take her up the aisle unless he meant it as a euphemism for something she'd only allow on his birthday. At a lunch with her friends, which with hindsight she would have been better off scheduling with wedding-obsessed Charlotte alone, Carrie tries to explain why this is all such a big deal. Samantha essentially proposes tricking Big into wanting to get married by not mentioning it to him. Not her finest hour, but unsurprising when you consider that in her world, getting down on your knees and putting rings on fingers usually have very different meanings. Miranda, often found lurking in the middle ground of these debates when she isn't daydreaming about drinking the blood of nearby men, reveals an extremist stance for a change. Men are becoming obsolete. You'd hope that this would be the lead-in to a speech about empowerment, but it's actually because she's recently invested in a new bedroom appliance. And I don't mean a heated blanket. So enthusiastic is her sales pitch that she convinces Carrie and Charlotte to buy one too. Charlotte, who acts like she expected it to look and feel like a cactus, is won over by the fact that it's bright pink. Carrie doesn't have much time to form an opinion because once she's home, she's interrupted by a call from Samantha. Samantha is freshly back from a DOA date with Jerry, who she knows as a guest from Perfect Brooks Wedding, but who I know as that angel from Supernatural. Less angelic was Jerry's swift abandonment of Samantha for a younger woman almost immediately after arriving. Humiliated, she tried to leave, but bumped into bad breath Bernie. Ever direct, Samantha semi-tactfully pointed out his death breath and discovered two things, that it was the result of Chinese herbs and that Bernie has an unexpected sense of humour. Coupled with a well-timed compliment, that earns him enough brownie points to redeem for a position as Samantha's new fixer-upper. Carrie interprets this, in addition to Miranda's contentment with a battery-operated boyfriend, as a sign that others are just making do with whatever they can get. She meets up with Brooke, as she understandably returns some minging wedding gifts and basically outright asks her if she got married to a mid-range guy just to get it out of the way. Under normal circumstances, by which I mean real life, asking this kind of question of a newlywed just back from honeymoon would get you a swift slap in the chops. But as usual, because this is Carrie's show, her wild and highly presumptuous theory turns out to be right. Brooke did settle, and when she spots Samantha playing dress up with Bernie like he's a very off-brand Ken doll, she implies that the same thing is happening there. As though the universe sensed the need for a break, we then join Carrie and Charlotte at a nice, relaxing yoga class. Unfortunately, Charlotte takes the opportunity to talk about breaking her cloven tuft with her new pink plastic pocket rocket. 
That she does so in mostly conservative terms and a raspy whisper makes it sound like the Republican Party have started their own ASMR channel. Charlotte claims to be scared by the device's ability to reliably take her to O-Town and worried that its effectiveness means that she'll never want to go near a man again. Because very few people in this show are capable of a measured reaction to anything, Carrie notes the telltale signs that Charlotte is developing an addiction. After a night at the ballet with Stamford, Carrie points out a gay couple walking down the street like she just strolled past their enclosure at the zoo. Stamford claims to be over the gay scene, largely as a result of an unsuccessful personal ad he recently placed in which he chose to describe himself as an Ed Harris type, by which he just means balding. Stamford's solution to 15 years of similar rejections is to suggest that he and Carrie should enter a sham marriage, so that he can get his homophobic grandmother to cough up his inheritance. Of course, this doesn't actually fix the fact that New York's gay singles would rather go it alone than have him anywhere near them. But with a runtime of 23 minutes, the show doesn't have time to dwell on this completely nonsensical plot device while it grinds its marriage-shaped axe. After complaining last week that her sex life with Big had gone off the boil, Carrie spends an apparently passionate Sunday in his bed. When she tells Big about Stanford's proposal, he absolutely nails her to the wall when he sarcastically comments that it should make for an interesting column. After another cancellation, Carrie and Miranda crash Charlotte's rabbit party to stage an intervention. Charlotte reluctantly hands it over, and Miranda puts it, unwashed, straight into her handbag. I'm going to let you fill in the obvious joke about that one for yourselves. Samantha, meanwhile, is at dinner with her upgraded version of the middle-aged mutant boring turtle. She realises that for all her efforts to step up his appearance, he's still the same guy she couldn't stand to be around at Brooke's wedding. Knowing that she can't settle for an also ran, she makes her excuses and leaves. Reluctantly at afternoon tea with Stanford and his grandmother, against the backdrop of a hideous Regency-style interior design nightmare, Carrie pretends to be a woman who hasn't clocked that her fiancé pitches, or let's be honest, catches, for a different team. After seeing all the photos of Stanford's family, Carrie realises that one day she'll want to start one of her own, and so the only beard her GBF is going to have access to anytime soon is the one growing on his grandma's chin. It turns out that it's all been for nothing anyway, because Don't Say Gay Granny is no slouch. She knows Stanford's real orientation and has no intention of ever letting him see a cent of her money, possibly because she's planning to spend it on more rancid 40-year-old Chanel outfits. At Big's place, Carrie watches him tip a load of salt into a tomato sauce without a word in what I'm choosing to believe is a sign that she's playing what will turn out to be a successful long game with his internal organs. She finally blurts out that she does want to get married someday and can't see the point in dating a man who doesn't. Big vaguely suggests that with time he might change his mind, and bizarrely, Carrie decides that she should slow down and live in the moment. Which is exactly the opposite of the message she's been running towards this whole episode. Another example of how she actively allows her inexplicable fixation on Big to hold her in place when any other sensible person would already be kicking loose the release lever on the fire escape or setting fire to his parade of red flags to clear a path to the front door. So that's it for this episode. Don't forget to drop a like if it was ribbed for your pleasure, comment if it tickled you pink, and if you can, please share these videos so that others can come enjoy the good vibes with us. And if you're still here, this week's question is, would this have been the final straw for you with Big, or like Carrie, would you still be hanging in there? Answers in the comments, please, and the best will make an appearance in next week's video. Either way, thanks for watching, and as ever, if you can't be good, be crusty.